he's going to need to start tucking or we're getting a divorce. <laughs> I hope you leave that in, um, like, in that podcast before the episode starts and they're going through the theme song. They will plop in funny things that... I used to do that. The guys say... No, you didn't. Yes, I did. Where I would intro Oh, it. okay. It's out of context, so it would be funny to be like, you gotta talk... You don't remember that I used to do that all the time. Oh, I don't know. Hmm. Okay. I like, the, I like the really confident, no, you didn't. <laughs> Well, I felt very confident about it. <laughs> well, that's misplaced. Craig and thinks that the... Okay. <laughs> Craig, shut the fuck up. <laughs> Shoes. Welcome to SV Pod Especially Heinous. I am Gabe. I am Tasha. I'm unhinged. <laughs> <laughs> this is the fucking last episode of season four, dudes. It's the last episode. You guys, you have no fucking idea what my last couple days has been like. Um, mm-hmm. it is, it's is. it been the most stressful, lowest stakes shit ever. So I opened up my computer last night because I'm like, oh, I'm just going to go over my chaser soups quick before, just to make sure I have all my, you know, T's and I's and all that. And it was fucking gone. The whole thing, all of my notes, the entire episode, hours of work, completely gone. Mm-hmm. I called Gabe. John John's trying to fucking find it in my computer. I'm calling Apple. Something got fucked up. My computer's being weird. Something. All of my notes were gone. So Gabe's like, I can send you mine. And I'm like, no, I don't want your jokes. I don't want to know what you have in there. So last night, it wasn't time for me to fucking work. And I was like, well, I guess I'm going to do all the notes all over again. I'm going to rewrite my chaser and I'm going to open a bottle of wine and we will find out by the end of this if it's any good or not, because I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> Mm-hmm. But I pounded it out in like three hours, which is like half the time I normally do That's it. That's crazy. Yeah. She sent me a text that was like done. And I was like, what? Gabe's like, are you doing meth again? Because you better be. That was <laughs> Oh, yeah, I forgot. That was funny. I love, it was. I love how in your mind doing meth makes me productive. <laughs> Isn't that what speed things do? I don't know. Um, Yeah, but in my experience, it was more like if what I needed to get done was to tell my life story and chain smoke cigarettes, I would have been crushing it when I was doing that. <laughs> <laughs> if you're doing meth right, you're getting shit done. <laughs> the right? more you know. Do I get a fucking cutting board, Abby? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Anyways, okay, hold on. We were on season four, episode 25, Soulless. This was a fucking pretty good episode. I started off, I was like, oh, I hate this. Really? Yeah, oh, rich people killing people. Okay, whatever, they do that. Like, I hate those. That <laughs> That's shit. what rich people do. Fucking crab cakes, flag football, and killing other people. That's what Maryland does. Yeah. <laughs> Did you say Maryland? Maryland, yeah. Wedding Crashers? Oh, yeah. God, that was a good movie. Call me Kitty Cat. <laughs> Tummy sticks. Ew, I don't like that. (laughs) Okay, the opening scene, Benson is at the hospital talking with a nurse about a female patient that was brought in earlier. The patient was passed out drunk. The nurse says that they hooked her up to a banana bag, which is like this hangover cure thing, Uh this rehydrating thing. I looked into it. I was really hoping it was shaped like a banana, but it wasn't. What is it? Just like full of potassium? Yeah, it's just, and the the color of it is like a little bit yellow Mm -hmm. because there's so much like hydrating shit in there. You can like buy them. Oh, that sounds amazing. (laughs) But the patient started to choke on her own vomit. They started cutting her clothes with trauma shears and the patient started freaking out and thought she was being raped. This nurse, she plays a nurse another time this season as well. And she was also in Goodfellas, which is always worth a mention. Have you ever seen Goodfellas? Yeah. Oh, you know what? I think I ask that every time it comes up. Have you ever seen The Secretary? Get out of my fucking life. I love you so much. (laughs) Uh what a reaction ha cha cha <laughs> ew um i know i have a dog in my robe shush you're gonna leave that in <laughs> it's so bad okay ha cha cha ha cha cha a lot of shoulder work that everybody's gonna miss out on mm. benson goes into the room and she starts talking with chloe that's the patient mm-hmm. chloe tells benson that she doesn't think the rape happened and that she just wants to go home at first i was like oh my god is this avril lavigne no it's jane sterling from mad men roger sterling's wife that's what i recognize her from oh. um and she's had a bunch of reoccurring roles in different shows and this is her second of three spots on sview Hmm. Chloe tells Benson that she doesn't think that the rape happened and that she wants to go home. 
Benson tells her that just because she was drinking doesn't give anyone the right to rape her. And then Benson gives her a contact card just in case she wants to change her story or tell her story, I should say. Mm -hmm. Benson sees a UV light stamp on Chloe's hand, but she gets pissed and tells Benson to fucking drop it. She's like, where were you? Were you at a club? Like, what the fuck? So now Benson's still in the hospital, but she's talking to a different nurse. Mm -hmm. The nurse says that Chloe reported her rape when the IV was being put in. The nurse totally believes Chloe, says that she was hysterical when she came in. She had a head contusion that seemed concerned consistent with an attack benson's like well maybe she passed out and hit her head and the nurse is like no it's actually on the top of her head like someone hit her the nurse from the beginning of the scene shows up just behind benson out of nowhere and she's like oh my god we have a situation with chloe the nurse tells benson that chloe was detained and discharged because she didn't have an id some guy came in and was harassing chloe when she was trying to pay the bill the nurse thinks that it could have been the rapist as they approach the desk like the billing desk the billing lady named nancy is sitting on the floor with a bloody nose she says that the guy was yelling at Chloe and was dragging her away without paying the hospital bill. The billing person tried to stop him and he fucking punched her in the face. Oh shit, she is definitely going for a half beer after work. Right. The guy ended up getting away with Chloe, even though Chloe was kicking and screaming the entire time. In the precinct, Stabler and Craig do a walk and talk. Witnesses saw a guy with Chloe in a gray or blue car. It was too dark to see the make or model or license plate. So all the shit that Chloe gave them, her number, the address, it's all baloney. <laughs> Stabler says Benson was already in overtime and she took the call for Chloe. She hasn't slept and tells Craig and he needs to fucking send her home. She's not doing too good. Like that would ever fly if fucking Benson said that to him. Mm -mm. No. Stabler needs to go home. It never, whatever. Stabler follows Craig into the bathroom. Stabler can't figure out how the perp knew where Chloe was. You hear the toilet flush and fucking Munch comes out of a stall. I like to think that he wasn't pooping, that he like pees sitting down. <laughs> That's what I was hoping. You know what? Munch has shown me that he's advanced in so many ways. I think that that just adds to that picture of him for me. Yeah. Oh my God. He pees sitting down because he has so many piercings in his dick that it sprays <laughs> everywhere if he's standing at a urinal. Do I know that? Because I know of that personally. Sure do. <laughs> Kragen thinks that the rapist followed the ambulance to the hospital to get Chloe. Munch thinks Chloe called the rapist and that they know each other. It would explain why she decided to drop the charges. Apparently, date rapes are often dropped. Yeah, and the whole time, Craigan's like, could you guys fuck off? I'm trying to pee and... Yeah. I'm like, he's probably got stage fright. And then I started thinking about everybody's relationship with each other. Do you think that Benny and Stabes leave the door open when they're together and somebody's got to pee? No. Okay. Mm. I bet you Stabler does. I'm not talking shitting. No, if he's peeing, I could see him like still talking, peeing, you know, and like looking back and talking to her and her being like, ugh, you know what I mean? But not the other way yeah. around. Yeah, I think she, well, because she has a, a line that she respects. I could see her if they're in an intense conversation or they're like figuring something out. I could see her leaving the door cracked. I don't see that and I also don't see when I couldn't see the show portraying her as having human bodily functions like that. I mean, we're not talking show. We're talking their real life behind the scenes as cops. I'm going to keep going. Okay. <laughs> also, I'm just going to I'm just going to leave this here. I'm not talking shitting, but if I have never peed in front of you, please know that we're not friends. I think you've pooped in front of me and I hated it. No, you know what? You, no. You I, had, no, you had the door open and I probably closed it. I don't poop in front of people intentionally. There was there was one time, remember I like took a picture of you and If I've ever oh, if I've peeing. pooped in front of you it was completely a surprise to both of us because i would never yeah i've never pooped in front of anybody either no i don't poop in front john and i've been married we, i don't like that almost 10 years we've I just, never I'm pooped not, in front i mean i'm not into that no i turn into if you walked in on me pooping i'm a raccoon on a dumpster in the middle of the night <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. i don't i'm not gonna do it okay munch is gonna check the hospital luds they're hovering around Craigan at the urinal and he says yeah this makes sense so does a little privacy <laughs> <laughs> He has his dick in his hand. <laughs> Still in the precinct, Benny's at her desk. She's fallen asleep. And Craig and tells her, you need to go home. You need to get some rest. Not fucking Benny. Mm -mm. She's determined to find Chloe. So Toots pulled images from the hospital security cameras. There was a guy who had dark glasses and a hat on who was trying to avoid the cameras as he passed them. But Chloe, who he's dragging out, can be seen looking right at the camera and her face looks terrified. Mm -hmm. The paramedic who worked for a private company that transported Chloe didn't complete the report properly. So there's missing information. They don't even know where they picked her up necessarily. Okay, so the ambulance service was hired by the club. They didn't use public EMS, which Toots says is a way that clubs avoid charges. Like over-serving and stuff. Yeah, people get too drunk, fucked up things happen at the club, and they don't want liability. So they're going to sneak somebody off into a private ambulance and still get them help. Benson mm -hmm. tells the fellas, hey, I grabbed a rape victim's wrist aggressively to check out the nightclub stamp on her hand. It was an elephant. <laughs> 
Cragen wants them to find out which club it was from. Toots and Muncher on the street talking to the, the paramedic who brought Chloe into the hospital. OMG, this fucking guy. Okay. He looks like Kevin Bacon's like more handsome brother. Did you notice that? Yes. And he kind of looks like that Titus guy. Tid- oh, yeah. Right. Oh, my God. I haven't thought about that in forever. The only credit of his that you need to know is a 2020 short he was in called Wear a Mask, Bat Dick bat dick yeah i can't find it anywhere he was also in a bunch of episodes of scandal it was like a batman theme kind of thing because at first i'm like bat dick that is hilarious but it makes it's more contextual once you see it's batman the medic claims that chloe was passed out on canal street in tribeca and a good samaritan had called it in and they were like okay they called a private ambulance service and not 911 a good samaritan's just gonna fucking call 911 you know right they were like what fucking club was she at and he's like i don't know dude she was soused <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Probably stumble out of one. I just can't tell you which. I know I took a video of that guy saying soused because it was hilarious. Soused. <laughs> but Toots and Munch take turns stepping closer and closer to this guy saying cop shit until they're physically inside of his mouth. And he admits <laughs> he picked her up at a place called air bar so benny and staves go to air bar they're talking to the owner who is fucking pissed about the smoking ban we're old enough Mm -hmm. to remember when you could smoke in bars and i remember being so bummed when it passed here yeah because my favorite thing was to go to the bar i mean i was young so i did young people in wisconsin things where it's like oh i got off work at 11 i better go and catch up with everybody so i would do two jaeger bombs and slam a double captain and coke and then i would light a cigarette and have a cocktail (laughs) yeah (laughs) <laughs> and I remember when that haze, that haze and fucking. I didn't start work. I what? I was bummed about it only because of the winter. Uh huh. But I was also like oh, kind of glad because it was like bad. Yeah. You know. But then all these bars that didn't have patio seating were like trying to invent patio seating somehow so that people didn't leave. Eventually, everybody got used to it. But for a while, we would drive all the way out to outlying townships and whatever because mm-hmm. it was banned in Madison first. It was a citywide ban, and you could go anywhere else in the state even in like in the county to and you could smoke at a bar there was a bar now it's like national right i know it's statewide i don't know if there's i mean you can probably smoke in a bar in florida i mean i don't know some let us know but i'm not coming i don't care um yeah (laughs) but i also don't smoke (laughs) that's i also don't smoke anymore (laughs) but i remember going to this bar down the street from my house i lived on fucking fair oaks which is in the middle of by the atwood neighborhood east side whatever and there was a bar down the street that just it was like a weird placement where it didn't fall in the city of madison it was something else so you were allowed to smoke in this one bar which is basically a garage in a house and uh my friend kayla and i went to that bar and it started on fire (laughs) nobody like everybody (laughs) stared at us when we walked in because it was like the three regulars and we're just like we just want to be able to smoke in a bar (laughs) and then the place started on fire and we never went back while you were there yeah oh wow we had to go stand outside and we're like should we take off so i don't think it burned down i'm sure they whatever anyway benny's like i think the liquor board would be more interested in how many patrons are rolled out of here with acute alcohol poisoning oh this is what i wrote in my notes last night i plan on getting absolutely adorable alcohol poisoning by the end of these (laughs) notes (laughs) I was just thinking, I'm like, a cutie patootie alcohol poisoning? <laughs> Adorable alcohol poisoning. The bar owner denies knowing about the number of people that leave the club with alcohol poisoning. Stabler calls her out on using the private ambulance service. I didn't even know that existed, by the way. I mean, uh, I didn't either. <laughs> But he's like, he's like, cops aren't going to show up with a private ambulance service. That's interesting why you would use that. And she's like, it sounded like you were about to, like, you were like flipping your hair, being like, oh, I'm super bougie. I've been in a private. Am- like, I, that's what I thought you were going to say. No, that was the joke. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, my God. Crush that one. <laughs> Boom. We're going to do good at our, at our event. <laughs> this, this live show is going to be funny and jokes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I admit, um, this live show is going to be a joke. Mm, there it is. There it is. So the bar owner's like, fuck you, guy. Fuck you, you hot, muscly butt. <laughs> <laughs> we use the private ambulance service to go. Th- fuck you, you giant ripped ass. <laughs> okay. So this bar owner says that she uses the ambulance service to go the extra mile for her patrons to protect Mm -hmm. the clients because she knows that people have died waiting for 911. So Uh above and beyond over there. Wow. Stabler shows. Wow. Wow. (laughs) It's crazy. Stabler shows. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) It's crazy. You're crazy, girl. You're crazy. 
<laughs> that little wow. Wow. That'll never, I'll never not laugh at that. Stabler shows her a photo of Chloe and Benson tells her about what happened to Chloe before she was taken to the hospital. And the owner's like, well, you're going to need a court order to get the guest list here. And they're like, well, Chloe's fucking missing now. So she reluctantly turns to the bartender who's just fucking standing there staring at them huh. off camera. His name is Roger. <laughs> she tells him to grab the ID that they found in the bathroom the night before. And Stabler's like, you've had an extra pair of gloves this entire time? And she's like, yeah, we're in the Rockies. God, what is that from? Oh, my God. Dumb and dumber. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that. Oh, man, are my references getting that old that people that were even old enough for them are not? Yeah, we're in the Rockies. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. You're crazy, girl. Wow. The, <laughs> the ID is Chloe's. On the ID, it says her name is Jenna Sterling. She's 21 years old. But Benny's like, mm, not her. The photo doesn't match. And the owner's like, it's hers, dude. We found this in the men's room stall where Chloe was found passed out. And Benny's just like, men's room? And it goes to the next scene. Like, that's wild. Somebody, I used to go in the men's room all the fucking time if there was a long line. Yeah. Now we're at the Sterling residence. It's Thursday, May 1st. Two more days till my birthday. They're putting up balloons, streamers. Everybody's getting ready, nervously peeking out the door, waiting for their Amazon package to arrive. Already <laughs> gift wrapped for Gabe. Oh, I'm so excited. I actually I want a present. I like really want to open a present right now. <laughs> okay, Benson Stabler are there. Jenna says she hasn't been to a men's room since, quote, daddy dragged us to Hong Kong and my Cantonese was still choppy. She says she has never, ever been to the air bar, but hears it's fabulous. Benson runs a UV light over her wrist and doesn't find a club elephant's stamp. Jenna says the night before she was with her parents at a gallery. Jenna is shown a picture of Chloe, but she says she's never seen her. Jenna was told that Chloe used her ID. She was like, oh my god, I'm so fucking glad you found it. I lost it a few weeks ago. You should have had a new one by now, but whatever. In the precinct, the team confirms Jenna's story about losing her ID. She had applied for a new ID a week ago. Stabler tells Benson to fucking go to the dang crib and get some god dang sleep. <laughs> Get some ding dang sleep. Munch pipes up and had found that a patron from the list had a prior sexual offense. Benson comes back down the stairs and says, Who? Morse Brandenburg, who goes by Bonecracker. All the detectives are like, Whoa, that sounds like a pretty tough street name. And Toots is like, It's it's not. The dude's a fucking rapper. And Stabler's like, He's white though. And oh my God, Toots is like, They don't get any whiter than Cracker. <laughs> oh my. It was just stupid. So the detectives go to speak with Cracker and this fucking dude he's at this like soundboard going uh, 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 and it looks like fucking jamie fucking kennedy in malibu's most wanted oh my god right yes i was yeah first i was mad at him for wearing a do-rag i'm like take it off and let's see what's under there like what is the point of that because that has a point what are you what are you doing what are you waving what are you <laughs> what protective style are you doing for your fucking wispy ass bullshit hair but yeah this whole scene we are all tangential embarrassed for this guy and, mm -hmm. and and i deep dove on him because i'm like oh you look super familiar did you watch that series maniac it was from a couple years ago you know what? i didn't see oh it oh my god it was to. good jonah hill and emma stone were in it he's in it he's one of mm -hmm. the sleeping experiment people yeah i haven't seen it yet well check it out <laughs> so munch and twos asked him where he was last night and he says he was at the player's ball and it was off the hizzy this dude <laughs> sucks so hard <laughs> <laughs> they tell him that they know about how he was charged with some shit because he and his manager double teamed a groupie Ugh. but she didn't sign off on the manager this cracker guy legit says quote manager gets 10 percent of everything okay which is fucking disgusting he actually said manager gets 10 percent of everything <laughs> oh I, I even wrote it that way why did i say it um like that? because you were too embarrassed <laughs> it was so embarrassing. As soon as he said it, I'm like, ew. He's all of us, and I hate it. Ew, manager gets 10% like, of everything. Thought she knew that. Eh, eh, ick. Ick. Go to your mom's in Connecticut for Christmas, you fucking joke. Ugh. <laughs> Toots, Toots and Munch ask Cracker about the night at the club and show him a photo of Chloe. He says he doesn't do JB, which means jailbait. He thought that she was jailbait because of who she was hanging out with. He legit pulls out a binder <laughs> full of women. <laughs> right? <laughs> AKA burn book. 
with news clippings of people he's met. It's fucking bananas. Yeah. Chloe, a.k.a. the victim, was with Vienna, a.k.a. Jenna Sterling's sister. <gasps> what? That bitch. <laughs> Back to the fucking Sterling residence. Benson's talking to Jenna and says, you know what? I need to speak with fucking Vienna. And Jenna says, Vienna, who is an hike school, didn't need to steal her ID because clubs just let Vienna in. Just then Vienna walks in. This is Ash Burrett. She quit acting in 2015 and has been producing ever since. This is the first time I've hmm. seen that on one of our actors. And then it cuts to me speed taking my notes last night. And I'm Lucio Bluth with my glass of wine. And I'm like, good for her. <laughs> Also, both of these sisters are fucking gorge. They're perfectly cast mm -hmm. as sisters. Yeah. Their casting was really good. In it this. really was. Anyway, Vienna walks in with a bunch of shopping bags and Jenna's like, you bitch, you stole my ID. <laughs> and Vienna denies taking the ID. She denies knowing Chloe and she denies being at fucking air bar. And Vienna's just like, I wasn't there. Benny snags her hand and chucks a blue light at it. Boom. Elephant stamp. And she goes, oh, well, the elephant says you were. And then Stabler, who really needed a contribution, goes, oh, my God. And they never forget. I fucking roll. Pass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Vienna's like, oh, you got me, you clever little joke maker. She admits that she took Chloe, Chloe Dutton is her name, to the bar because she was having a bad day. So Benny's like, listen, you need to take this seriously. Chloe was fucking raped. And Vienna's like, oh, my God, I thought she went home. I went to go on the dance floor and I came back and she was gone. Holy shit. Chloe's in fucking ninth grade, you guys. Ew. Stabler's dad brain splatter all over the walls mm -hmm. and then they were like well did you see chloe at school and she goes no we go to different schools also chloe's fucking 15 you guys and they're like yeah we established that she's in ninth grade i think i was 14 in ninth grade whatever i was a young i was a young ninth grader i was an old ninth grader i was an old ninth grader oh yeah because uh because your birthday's what is it may 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 4th <laughs> <laughs> i almost was like may 3rd like <laughs> what is it in the precinct Toots, Benny, and Cragen walk and talk into the squad room to go over the details with everybody. Toots says Chloe didn't show up for school, but the school says that's normal. Sounds like Chloe's off doing her own thing. This time it's because her mom is out of town at a fat farm. Okay. And Chloe was supposed to be staying at her dad's for the week. This is the information they got from her mother. While dad is Phil Dutton, his assistant at his fancy job says it was supposed to be Chloe's week to stay with her mom. It's the old teenager switcheroo. Benny immediately parent blames and says the two obviously don't care about their fucking daughter. Mm -hmm. And Stabler walks by, because he's a dad, and makes a comment about Chloe playing her parents for a night out. And he's like, ah, she's working them. It's what teenagers do. Yeah, I bet you'd be totally fine with it if Marine did that. And Benny's right. like, oh, great. Now she deserves what she got. She flips a fucking desk right in the middle of the precinct. Mm -hmm. Benny does not like that. Stabler's like, chill, dude. Yeah. And Craigan's like, are you getting your period? Maybe you should go home. Just kidding. She's really tired. And <laughs> Craig is like, you should go he home. He just throws a tampon at her. <laughs> Just then Benny's phone rings and she completely ignores Craig and who's like, hey, sweetie, do you want to go take a nap? Answers the phone, slams it down. Chloe was found. Jackets. <gasps> Let's go. Riverbank of the Hudson. Here we are. It's Benny, Stabes, Corner Warner, and they're walking up to a body covered with a sheet. Chloe washed up on the bank of the river and was found by a patrol officer. Corner Warner thinks Chloe was knocked out and drowned, but the bump on her head was from before. Remember, like the nurse said at the hospital, mm -hmm. Benny's blaming herself because she cares. Corner Warner. <laughs> <laughs> you nailed that. That was really good. <laughs> that was like super good. Thank you. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I can't wait to hear it again. <laughs> I can't even do it that good. Thanks. <laughs> Corner. <laughs> Corner Warner finds Benson's contact card fucking shoved in Chloe's mouth. Oh my God, you guys, Dude. watch The Fucking Patient with Stephen <sighs> Leslie Carell. It is so good. Oh, this is just a note to myself. I need to slow down because I'm already half a bottle in and we're 12 minis into the episode. <laughs> okay. I love that we both write minis all the time. I did that drunk, so it was completely not even intentional. I, yeah, 12 minutes in. How did I finish this? Oof. I have no idea. I think you hit like a... Let's hit a time warp, yeah! <laughs> or wait, let's do... The... Okay. Yeah. Now we're in the middle... <laughs> Fucking, hey, oh, are we nailing it today? Are we a couple of contractors just fucking <laughs> nailing it? <laughs> Why are you doing this on your bike? Are you a couple of contractors <laughs> nailing it? 
<laughs> you do that a lot. I love it. It is the end of the season. Now we're in the medical examiner's office. Coroner Warner says the cause of death is Chloe was thrown in the river, hyperventilated, and drowned. Mm-hmm. The water in her lungs didn't match the water from the Hudson. Boop. Yeah, the water in the Hudson is brackish. And I was like, oh my God, remember that metal band Kitty from the 90s? Yeah. Ew. Yeah. Brackish was a hit song on their first album. And Hmm. so then I was like, oh my God, I never thought about what that meant. It just means kind of salty. So (laughs) disappointing. The the water in her lungs was tap water that had a cleaning chemical in it. Chloe was drowned in a fucking toilet. And there's fingerprints on the back of her neck supporting it. Chloe's parents show up to ID the body. Corner Warner tells Benson and Stable to stall them because she's going to try to clean up the body a bit because there's like so marks uh, and all that stuff. Yeah. We haven't hit this gem in a minute, but dad's name is Philip and mom's name could be any fucking thing because we never hear it. Just another nameless woman. A gorgeous nameless woman. Mm-hmm. She's pretty. She doesn't need a name. She's been given enough. <laughs> So they go and speak with the parents. The parents are still arguing about who was supposed to be watching her. And they're pissed that they can't see the body in person. They have to ID her on television because Stabler is like, you should wait until the funeral. It will be, quote, easier. You know what I mean? Because it's her body looks bad. Yeah. And then he hits play on a TV that's been rolled in by the high school AV department. Right. Pull back the sheet and you see the body and the mom just like flips out and yells at the dad. And he's and he's just like in shock. It's really sad. I was even angrier that she didn't get a name because she... She nailed that. Mm -hmm, She did. Now we're at the Chatham School, May 2nd, the day before my birthday. Benson and Stabler go to speak with Chloe's friends. They're doing a walk and talk with the principal. She calls Chloe a loner and says she was miserable, no friends, and had issues at home. And I was like, Jesus, miserable fucking A, dude. Yeah, at least she wasn't ugly like that last little bitch. (laughs) (laughs) The last little, like, (laughs) 10-year-old. The principal goes up and again, just another motherfucker on standby. There's just a janitor there holding bolt cutters and she walks up Mm -hmm. and just goes, cut the lock. Yeah. It was like I standing there. A note was found from a quote BT saying that Chloe screwed them and that Chloe was dead to them. The principal checks the roster for a student with those initials. Mm -hmm. Also, Benson and Stabler go into the locker without gloves. Yeah, which is really weird. It's just an interesting choice. It's it's just a it's just a not a great choice, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> now we're at the priest. Okay, calm down. <laughs> I I was drunk. I was drunk because I have some notes here. We go into the precinct, into the interview room with BT. We never get a full name, but he is IMDB'd as Bernie Thorkel. They never say his name, but he gets one. It's because of his penis. It's the name of his penis. Dude, dude's got a wiener named Bernie fucking Thorkel. They call him Thorkel the Stork. <laughs> Thorkel the Snorkel. <laughs> fucking drunk Shit. Tasha is so stupid. I fucking love uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> so Toots and Munch are interviewing this kid. He left a note in Chloe's locker. Bernie fucking Thorkel the Snorkel or whatever. <laughs> Chloe and him had been working on a science project about water, and they're like, oh, water? Red flag, because Chloe was drowned. Mm-hmm. They were doing some project about acid rain, and dude was pissed that he had done all the work. BT last saw Chloe two days before. She ditched the time they had set to work on the project. He saw her ride by him in a car with a guy that was, like, high school or college-aged, and he remembered the license plate, but not the car maker model. He writes down IL4-42D, and he says, I live for 42 Ds, and then, like, licks his braces. It was fucking <laughs> Weird. He's like, ugh. Like, your parents hate you. Ugh. Munch and Toots are now talking to these valets in this parking garage, right? These kids look like they came out of the same printer, but the one that's talking is running out of ink. <laughs> <laughs> They're cute, and th- yeah. that makes me suspicious. Oh. And they're also way too chill. When they're talking about Mr. Stark, mm-hmm. they could every working class person in New York on the show talks about their rich clients, like, fucking rich, blah, blah. And they're just like, yeah, we try to help our client. And I was like... Yeah, on the second, when I had to redo my notes, I was, like, analyzing more of what they were doing, because at first, it completely just whoosh, blew right past me. I was just mm-hmm. like, these guys, this fucking up-and-up roundies market pantry Kelso and Fez <laughs> motherfuckers, like... <laughs> These fucking... <laughs> so Munch and Toots are talking to these young gentlemen about the car with this fucking make and model and license plate, right? And they're mm-hmm. like, oh, this car belongs to a 
wealthy couple that's staying at the hotel, the Starks. Mm -hmm. They checked in on Monday, but they last called for the car on Tuesday. And dude hasn't used the valet service since. Oh, shrug. Mm -hmm. So they don't don't know if he's driven it anywhere or where it's been. Yes. So now Benny and Stabes go up to the Starks hotel suite. They are completely like unnecessary characters in this, but I'm so glad they're here. I am, yeah, I'm thankful and grateful. They've and I love us. the wife. Love her. Oh my god, I love her entrance. Same. Okay. If you have anything to contribute, please interrupt. Okay. So, Mr. Stark is a John Ritter, Pete Holmes mashup with Will Ferrell yes. as George W. Bush voice. Okay. Yes. All Southern. Yes. All the. Yeah. He tells them the first few days I drove everywhere. Mrs. Stark's. Yeah. <laughs> Mrs. Stark walks in. It's Joey Lauren Adams playing Nancy Grace. Her hair. Oh my God. Is, is huge. It is. It is a textbook blowout in the south. Uh-huh. Okay. And she's got like a glass of boots, and she like saunters in. Yeah. Like. Side eyeing her husband the entire time. Like, you know, she hates him. She hates him, and her hair is backcombed to the gods, this woman. Uh huh. So she comes in. Zane says, Everywhere we need to go is within walking distance. Within walking distance. She like draws it out and like, just like, fuck you, dude. I want to go somewhere. <laughs> I love her. <laughs> Stabler asks Mrs. Stark, who's been drinking since 11 a.m. Yeah. He hasn't. He's fucking. He's trying to stir shit up. Oh, yeah. Big time. You're missing the nightlife. If he's Ugh. not getting uh, information for the case, he is definitely putting some holes in that marriage. Yeah. So Stabler asks Mrs. Stark, he hasn't taken you out anywhere? And Mrs. Stark goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wrote that out. <laughs> With a Y. Not when there's yeah. clients to wine and dine. I took a video of it. I'll post it. Mm-hmm. Mr. Stark refuses to tell the detectives where he had been going with his clients and just calls it some supposed hot spot where the drinks are warm and the waitress is cold. I'm sure it's got a name, but damned if I can tell you what. So the detectives have the Starks go to the parking garage so they can search the vehicle because they're not going to put up with uh-huh. any other bullshit. Mm-hmm. And the music's all swelly and fucking Mrs. Stark's like, why are they doing this? They go in, they pop the trunk. The fucking valet kids are there. That should have tipped me off. I'm terrible at predictions. Mm-hmm. But they're hovering. They're like, oh, we don't know. We don't know what they need, Mr. Stark. Oh, Mr. Stark. Do you, do you need help, <laughs> Mr. Stark? <laughs> and he's like, you'll probably find a spare tire in there or something. <laughs> Benson, I don't know why I went from trying to imitate Will Ferrell's George W. Bush to being a southern plantation owner with a glass of sweet tea. Benny and Stabes, they're in the parking garage with these fucking Starks. Pop the trunk. Benson finds the pants that Chloe was given to wear at the hospital Mm -hmm. in his trunk. Mr. Stark is detained by detectives and dragged to the precinct. And Mrs. Stark is freaking out. They're they're not arresting him because he's cheating on you, but that's what she's pissed about. She's flipped. She's like, who the hell is Chloe? You cheating son of a bitch. What'd you do now? Ah! And Benson has to like hold her back. Benson? Yeah, they arrest him. Mr. Stark doesn't know what the fuck's going on. It's Obviously, the valet dude. No, this his, is what his, I have. Yeah. his hair has been in a wind tunnel since the day he was born. And this guy <laughs> is like, I don't know where you're taking me, what you're doing. Cut to the precinct interview room. Benny and Stabler pile into this room where Stark has his feet up on the table. And they're like, hey, uh-huh. guess what? We just talked to uh, your chatterbox wife, Mrs. Stark. We just had the nicest conversation with your wife. And I'm like, I'm sure they did. And Stark goes, what'd that cow say? <laughs> well... She told them that Mr. Stark cheats with younger women. So Benson shoves Chloe's autopsy photo in Stark's face. And she's like, you like I'm this young, you little freak. (laughs) He jumps out of the chair. I've never seen that girl before. I'm being railroaded. (laughs) You don't know how cutthroat the oil business is. Or maybe the old ball and chain finally fell off her nut. (laughs) Strategery. (laughs) <laughs> Mrs. Stark uh. also told them that Mr. Stark didn't come home the other night. So he's in a corner. He's got to tell them where he was. All right. Yeah. I cheat on my wife. Okay. That ain't a crime. Surprise. That ain't a crime. <laughs> Last I checked, that ain't a police matter. Mm-hmm. He tells them that he had gone to one of them titty bars that never closes with some of the other dudes that night. Then we went straight to the convention. Ask the boys. <laughs> Benny's like, yeah, barf. We will. 
names and numbers, you fucking dork. They also want his DNA, which he throws a hissy fit about. Rarest blood type, AB negative. I donate regularly. They call me the Tulsa Gusher. Slap, slap. Yeah, no one's ever fucking called him that. No, no. one's called him that in his fucking life. He is seconds and inches from fucking Stabler's face. Oh, they call me the Tulsa Gusher. Gross. Mm-hmm. God, men are so embarrassing. I know. Or in the precincts, Toots tells Stabler that witnesses play Stark at a place called Pika Boobs. <laughs> For the whole night. (laughs) For the whole night when Chloe had been attacked and kidnapped. The day BT saw Chloe in Stark's car, Stark was presenting at a convention. So the guy BT saw with Chloe couldn't have been Stark. Cragen tells the squad that the DNA found on Chloe's belongs to four different dudes. Stark isn't one of them. And then fucking Cragen says, there's more than one doer? (sighs) It's like, you don't have to say that. First of all, it's gross. And second of all, yes, they said. They already said that. They said that. Yeah. Craig thinks that the other oil dudes that were at the convention took Stark's car. All of a sudden, we hear Munch's voice from inside the rat walls, and he turns the corkboard around like he's fucking Dr. Evil. He's been hiding over there that entire time. Yeah. You just hear the scratching, and you're like, Munch? I think we've got a Munch in the walls. (laughs) <laughs> so Munch has put together some leads from the phone record, starting with a call Chloe made at the hospital. It helps narrow down the suspects, considering there was like 400 million people at the convention. He has this whole thing written on a chalkboard. Chloe made a seven minute call to Vienna from the hospital, which is weird because Vienna swore she didn't talk to Chloe after the club. After that, Vienna called Andrew. Then Andrew calls Davis. Davis calls Vienna. Vienna calls Seth. <gasps> Fragan wants Andrew, Davis and Seth picked up. We have three of the four of these dudes, possibly. So all three are arrested, taken in. Munch calls Andrew's name and messes up his serve on a a tennis court and yells, he's like, damn it! (laughs) Toot shows up at some country club or whatever and arrests the other kid. Stabler shows up with handcuffs and another kid is in bed with two girls. Stabler literally grabs the dude by the hair and pulls him out of bed. Like, I don't think you can do that. (laughs) Okay. You know I mean? Yeah, I mean, it is it is Elliot Gould's I mean, stabler can do whatever he wants. You got to do everything by the book because they're rich people. If you go back in order, all three of these guys, they could play young Bradley Cooper, young Conan mm-hmm. O'Brien, and young Dan Aykroyd in some sort of weird buddy film. Hmm. Shit. Yeah. I'll put together a side by side. I got nothing better to do. A side by side mm-hmm. by side by side by side by side. Okay. Cut to the street. Jetta and Vienna are walking down the street carrying shopping bags. They're talking shit about the attitude of the cashier. They're like, can you believe her? She's just a cashier. Benson stops them from getting in their car and arrests Vienna, which was very satisfying. Mm-hmm. In the precinct, they're doing interviews. Craigan and Cabot watch behind the glass in Craigan's secret garden where Craigan and other neighborhood kids find it on his uncle's estate and all band together to restore it to its formal glory. <laughs> So, you felt so good about it. I just loved watching you present it. And then I have, there's a crabby little disabled girl, but all she needed was to learn how to love again. Remember the girl in the, wheel, in the wheelchair yes. in the secret garden? In the, is the but secret I, garden? What is the, ooh, okay. Yeah. We didn't, I didn't, I, I was like, oh, wait, no, we're not in Craigan's Bridge to Terabithia. That's a whole different thing. <laughs> All four of them have gotten lawyers. They still have to find the fourth dude. None of them will talk and none of them will give up their DNA. I hate how Cabot calls them the boys, by the way. Like they're being Mm -hmm. held on suspicion of gang rape and possible murder. And she's like, well, we'll have to whatever she said about the boys. Mm -hmm. It just makes I just hate that whole thing. So Cabot has enough to get Vienna on obstruction, Mm -hmm. but there isn't enough to indict these guys. They're worried the boys will try and flee the country. But then Seth and his lawyer, Hot Trevor, walk in and offer to give up Seth's passport on the condition he be allowed to leave the state to start an internship in D.C. with some congressman. Cabot's like, yeah, you can go. And they take off. Munch and Toots are Craig and are like, what the fuck, Cabot? Cabot the rabbit, you little cute bunny. (laughs) She's like, dudes, he'll be in Virginia, which just became the first state to be able to collect DNA upon arrest, conviction not required. Munch says that blatantly violates constitutional rights and it'll be overturned. And Cabot says, as well, it should be, but hopefully not today. But I'm good. And I was like, ooh, it. you wily little coyote. Ooh, you sneaky, sneaky little Cabot. Stabler says, what are the odds Seth commits a felony in Virginia? And Craigan says, let me make a phone call. And I do not like that. 
Um, no, I don't either. But here we are. It works to our advantage. At the Arlington yeah. Police Station in Arlington, Virginia. Boom. What? Seth is sitting in a holding cell. Munch and Toots are walking in to pick him up. Hey, hey, hey. Seth is technically a viable suspect in a robbery because he fits the description. So they just figured out what they could make fit, right? Yeah. A six foot tall white man. And then Toots cuffs him and says, that's racial profiling. Sucks donut. And I was like, oh. You want a sucks donut? <laughs> Get picked up for racial profiling, you little fuck. Nom, 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 nom on that sucks donut. Well, because of the Virginia thing Cabot just told us about, they were able to snag his DNA on this bullshit arrest and run it through a Nash data bank. Boom. He came back as a match for one of Chloe's fucking rapists. So they're taking him back. Mm -hmm. Taking him back to New York City. Taking him back two and a half blocks away. Back to the state of New yeah. York. Into the city. He's like, they did not have a right to take my DNA. And Munch is like, yeah, well, right. You're congressman. <laughs> I hate all this, mm -hmm. but it's a show. So I'm like, yay. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And Seth's lawyer, Trevor, is going to be pissed, and I'm surprised he didn't, like, think of this. Well, you know what? Fuck That's him. why Cabot's number one. Right. Back at the precinct, Cabot is talking to Davis, who's in a Zach Morris wig, and also talking to his lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, you're so right. <laughs> Zach Morris is trash. <laughs> His lawyer's also there who has one of those very formal but relaxed affects. She's like, this mm. is preposterous. Oh, she talks like Erica Jane from Real Erica Housewives Jane. of Beverly Hills. You know, this is preposterous. Ooh, you don't have anything against my client. That's not how she talked. Seth ratted out fucking Davis, who claims the sex with Chloe was consensual, but Cabot tells him it wasn't because Chloe was fucking 15 years old. Davis was like, I didn't know she was underage. And his lawyer agreed with him. And she goes, she was in a bar being served alcohol. Boo. How was he supposed to know? Yeah. And Cabot's like, ooh, statutory doesn't require intent, which is yeah. great. As the adult, do your due diligence. Can we just make a few more steps before you put your dick in somebody and this wouldn't be whatever. Davis denies killing Chloe and doesn't know who did. He says that he was out with Andrew and Seth. They ran into a dude named Max, a friend of Andrew's. Max said that he mm -hmm. had sex with someone in the bathroom and she was barf quote open to more. Ew. Davis then says he didn't know that she was passed out when he was having sex with her, but she was definitely passed out when they left the bathroom. Ugh. Mm -hmm. Like, he's, like, gross and smarmy, and they, like, cast him super well for, like, a gross rich kid. Correct. Yeah. He goes on and says that Max is another, quote, crazy rich kid. His dad invented post-its or some shit. And I'm like, I'm sorry, is his dad Romy White or Michelle <laughs> Weinberger? Because if not, then that's a lie. I know. I thought the same. I was like, oh, my God, that's from that movie yeah so davis says that he doesn't know much about this fucking kid max and tells cabot to ask andrew about that guy it's his friend yeah now we go to benson interviewing andrew who is a blonde jason schwartzman staring a hole in the floor <laughs> Andrew says he met Max Van Horn a few weeks ago. He doesn't know much about him either, but his dad works for the CIA or something. And I was like, oh, this is a fake rich kid. Yeah. Max drives a black Porsche and a silver Jaguar. Mm -hmm. This is where I was, I'm like, yep, one of the valet kids. See, still, I didn't. I was just like silver Jaguar. And then I thought about in Mad Men, they, the, that one guy who pronounced it Jaguar. 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 Ja Jaguar. Jaguar. He was um, British Jaguar. or something. Jaguar. Oh. Max met Chloe through Vienna and could have been the one that picked her up from school. Vienna is also Andrew's girlfriend. Yes. Andrew denies killing Chloe, but he doesn't deny the rape. I know nothing of the murder. It must have been Max. 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 You I got whatever it takes. Oh my god. Okay, let's go. It's a piece of cake. So stand out. The night of the rape, when the phone calls were made, a call wasn't made to Max because he was already crashing on Andrew's couch. He's like, I didn't have to call him. Yeah. No, because, yeah, Andrew's the one who got the phone call. And he's like, oh, dude, Max is right here. So Max ran off when Andrew told him what Vienna had said on the phone call. Benson Stabler's stake out in front of Max's house. They're having a conversation about rich kids not having conscience, and nobody probably tipped Max off because they're not the type of people to go out on a limb for each other, which is true because all the phone calls weren't about warning them. It was like Vienna yelling at him for cheating on her. Mm -hmm. Just then, they see a hooded person walking up to the house, and then there's music, and they run up, and they're like, Max Van Horn! This dude turns around way too slow. Mm -hmm. It's fucking Mitch, the valley from the hotel. <gasps> fucking knew it whoa i didn't 
So this Mitch Max guy is being interviewed by Benson Stabler in the precinct. Mitch said he lied and he wanted to be one of the rich kids. He had taken the cars he valets out on joy rides, the black Porsche and the silver Jaguar. A few weeks ago, he took the black Porsche out and there was a huge line outside of a club and everybody was like looking at him like, whoa. And he's like, this was my inn. I was like, going to be a little rich kid for a day. Mm -hmm. So he went into the club. That was the night he met Vienna and Andrew. They clicked and even exchanged numbers. Mitch says that he was set up for the rape because they're fucking rich and bored or maybe they sensed he wasn't one of them. So Andrew asked Max if he'd pick up one of Vienna's friends and they'd all go out. So he picked up Chloe across the street from the school. Then he says to Sabler, you saw her. Would you think she was 15? And Sabler says, maybe not, but I wouldn't have gang raped her in a fucking bathroom. Mm -hmm. And then Mitch says... Andrew pulled him into the bathroom, and when I said no, they called me a wuss and pressured me into raping Chloe. I was like, what? He says it's a lie that the other kids said he started it. So it sounds so far-fetched to me because I'm a woman, maybe. I'm wondering if that's why, because it just sounds like Back to the Future, like you were called chicken kind of thing. Like, well, I better commit one of the most heinous crimes that you can commit so nobody thinks I'm a fucking pussy. Right. Uh, It's like, no. Mitch is like, these fucking dudes are going to get away with it because they're fucking rich. Mitch says he didn't kill Chloe, but all he knows is Andrew got a phone call at like 4 a.m. and said that shit went south and he had to borrow the silver jag to, quote, take care of it. Harry, I took care of it. (laughs) That's also uh, dumb and dumb. (laughs) Yeah. He wasn't with them, so he panicked and took a bus to his mom's house. When shown the security tape image of Chloe being dragged out of the hospital, Mitch is like, oh my God, I know that fucking jacket. That's Seth. That's who took Chloe. So we're still in the precinct. Cabot and Craig can go over the fucking details. Mitch has no prior record and Seth had already made a deal because he was the first to roll on everybody. If this checks out, Cabot's got to yank Seth's deal and she's not pumped about it. She's like, I don't like making deals until everyone's story is fucking out. Mm -hmm. So Craig is going to check into it. Oh, my God. So now we're at the Wilkins residence. It, Mitch's mom, that fucking lady, she's best known as Aunt Lydia from Handmaid's Tale. I fucking love her. And Dowd. She is amazing. Yes. Also, I'm sorry. Her IMDb needs to be updated because in the known for portion of her IMDb, it doesn't mention the 42 episodes of Handmaid's Tale. And also, she was in The Others. The Leftovers. The Leftovers, I mean. Yeah. She was also in True Detective, the first season. Mm-hmm. Oh, she's um, so she's, good. She's so she's good so in this episode, good. too. Yeah. Like, I didn't know they were going to come back to her later. And I'm just like, wow, what an untapped resource. But then they did. And it was oh, fucking worth it. Yeah. And that other lady, too. Yes. Fucking sugar water. <laughs> Edgar's yes. Wife. Oh, yeah. Fucking um, okay. sugar water. <laughs> So Mitch's mom confirms that he was at her house. They ask her what he said. And she's like, he told me that he took the car from the hotel to Joyride and he couldn't get it back in time. And the other kids took advantage of him and took the car. And Stabler's like, "Mm." but did he tell you about being involved in a gang rape? And she's like, what? Well, you have to understand. He's like, really wants to impress people. I was like, okay, well, whatever. Mitch's mom says he couldn't be involved in the murder because he was at her house. She says Seth picked Mitch up in the jag from her house the next day and took him to work at the hotel. What? Mm. Okay. Munch and Toots are at Seth's house fucking tearing the place up. They got a warrant. Dumping shit all over the place. Yep. And Seth's standing there like, oh, you guys, my stuff. Yeah. You know, if you told me what you were looking for, it would save my maid a lot of work. And like Toots totally ignores him. Right. He's like, oh my God, you're framing me again. He said it in a weird, just then. So Seth is fighting with Toots. I mean, it damn near comes to blows. But just then Munch comes in with the jacket and glasses from the security tape. And Seth's like, those aren't mine. Oh my God, you're framing me again. CSU tech Georgie comes in and whisks them all away to the bathroom. There are traces of blood on the base of the turlet and the bowl has blue water in it, which leads them to believe it's the same cleaner found in Chloe's lungs. Seth is arrested. Full on, you're under arrest. Back at the precinct, mm-hmm. Toots is done interviewing Seth and is chatting about oh my it. God. I have a typo. Instead of Toots, it says T-shits. <laughs> it says T-shits all over the newspaper. <laughs> oh, my God. That would be my fucking rap name. T-shits. Bonecracker and T-shits. <laughs> you know. Add it again. Swirling the bowl. Throwing away leggings into the dumpster. 
So Toots is done interviewing Seth and is chatting about it with Benny and Stabes. None of them fucking believe him and they don't get why he won't just cop a plea. Right. He, he also fucking says that he, he was like, I was on my daily 10K run. I'm like, fuck you. Daily? A woman walks in <laughs> and I'm like, ee! It's Elaine's roommate, Mm -hmm. Tina, again. We've seen her before in the Big Cat Nudes episode chat room. This is actor Siobhan Fallon Hogan. She's a funny redhead who's been in everything you've ever seen ever. Edgar's wife in Men in Black, the bus driver in Forrest Gump, the birthing teacher in Baby Mama. She's a fucking scene stealer. Yeah, she's amazing. She she always has like these itty bitty roles, steals it. And you and you know who you recognize her immediately. Anyway, yeah. she comes in holding the paper because Mitch had made the front page. She says that Mitch Wilkins killed Chloe. His real name is Eric Wayne Proctor, and he murdered her son. What? Yeah. This is one of those just twists. Big old end, twist. Huh? She says that Eric slash Mitch lived nearby, lived two blocks away from her 12 years ago. When he was mm-hmm. 10, he led her three-year-old son. Okay trigger warning the whole fucking chaser is going to be this too this is the shit that's really hard for me she says that Mm -hmm. when eric slash mitch was 10 years old he led her three-year-old son into the woods tortured him molested him poured gasoline on him and lit him on fire while he was still alive oh eric slash mitch this fucking little psycho was sent to a juvenile facility and they Mm -hmm. ask how can she be sure that eric's mitch and I had full goosebumps. She said, you never forget the face of the monster who killed your son. She is like the same caliber mm. acting as fucking, what's her face? Ann Dowd? Yeah. Her name? Just the tears in the eye. I mean, yeah. my God. Yeah. Like you pulled these fucking rad ass bitches out last second. You Ugh. fucking awesome motherfuckers. <laughs> you know. In Cabot's office, Benny and Stabler are chatting with Cabot about the woman who told them about Eric. The crime that he committed was considered the most gruesome murder in Bedford, New Hampshire. Hampshire's history. Mm. His name was never released when he killed the little boy because he was a minor himself. Remember, he was 10. Mm. Mitch's record was expunged when he got released from the detention center three years ago at 19, when he was actually supposed to be there until he was 21, but he got out for good behavior. Ugh. Woof. Cabot calls the claim a hunch, fucking question mark, and tells them that if they have the wrong murderer, then the detectives need to fix it before the trial. I'm sorry. Meaning Seth. Meaning Seth. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, though, because she's like that sounds like a hunch to me they just found out that this kid who's acting like he was manipulated into doing something fucked up is a insanely psychopathic criminal who did the most fucked up thing to a child and she's like i don't know sounds like a hunch though like would he i mean they have to flesh it out yeah I get Cause that. Because you can't just be like, oh, we think he did it because of his past. You, you know what I mean? Like, you have to have more. Well, go get it, team. Mm-hmm. Slap on the ass. Now we're in Rikers Island interview room. Benson and Stabler are talking to fucking Mitch Eric or whatever. Benson asks what he'd like to be called, Mitch, Max, or Eric. And he says, God, he's so smug in this. I think I had the most fun as Max. He says he didn't frame anyone, but then says, but if I had, Seth has the most money, best looks, brightest future. Who could resist? It's so crazy because his acting before was all like, I'm fr- I've been framed. I'm just a poor guy that wanted to have a good time. Oh, Whatever, geez. you know. Oh, geez, detectives. I mean, I'm still a rapist, but, you know, not, not as bad, right? Oh. Like, what the fuck? Benson's like, you made a fucking copy of Seth's house key you planted the jacket and the hat and the glasses it's the same way you got into all those cars benson's like man i totally we totally fucking believed your mom she must be a bigger sociopath than you he laughs and tells him that she didn't ever do anything bad to him there was no abuse to make him how he is and stabler just in his face called him a liar and he's like your mom must have done something fucked up to you mm-hmm. and then eric mitch laugh whispers like i wish <laughs> yeah poor old thing got hate mail death threats she got spit on the streets but she stuck it out there just to see me and then he goes now that's love ew i know benson's like you think your mom can't be fucking broken you think you are in total control of her just fucking watch me and then eric mitch whatever jumps up and gets in her face and he's like bring it on bitch <laughs> and stabler <laughs> stabler pushes him back down and benson's like oh it's already been brought in yes. and then mitch just laughs and puts his hands up and says oh. <sighs> like i said there's nothing to be broken but do go easy on the old gal. I've put her through so much already. Fucking yikes, yikes dude. Yikes. Benson and Stabler are just trying to fucking convince Eric's mom that her son is a fucking psycho. Yeah. They're trying to make her see that she lost fucking everything sticking by this fucking kid. Her job, her friends, her husband. 
I wonder if it was his dad. Where's the fucking dad? Okay. They tell her this time he brought her into this shit. She lied to them. She denies that he killed Chloe and says that he didn't know what he was doing when he killed that boy when he was 10. He thought it was a game. And Stabler's like, dude, this is not a fucking game. Your son is sick. Yeah. She's like, no, no, no. He's cured. They cured him. He's doing so well. He has a job. He lives in a brownstone. He has friends. But Benson tells her that he played the counselors and juvenile detention staff to get out early. I'm like, super into this right now can you imagine convincing yourself that your 10 year old child thought that what they were doing like the shit that they described what he did to that three-year-old was a game and i mean i under i I could see a mom just not even being able to process that and just doing what like no this is my child yeah i guess you gotta really fucking mind fuck yourself you know yeah just like as a, a survival tool for yourself yeah i guess So Benson tells her that he played the counselors and juvenile detention staff to get out early. He showed them exactly what they wanted to see, just like what he does with her. And she's like, you don't know him. He's a good boy. And she's doing it all fucking like and down and like crying and screaming and she's amazing they show her a photo of him dragging chloe out of the hospital and another photo of chloe's dead body they tell her exactly what he did to chloe but she still denies that he murdered her benson looks at the hospital security photo and then she goes oh my god in disgust Mm -hmm. chloe has on a bracelet but the bracelet was gone when her body was found and then saver says mrs wilkins where did you get that bracelet she's fucking wearing it and she's like speechless she's absolutely she's like looking around like i have nothing Uh. now we're in trial eric's mom is on the stand Eric is looking straight ahead, not even looking at her, whatever. Mm -hmm. Cabot asks her when Eric gave her the bracelet. She said it was on a Friday, the first week of May. Okay. That (laughs) Cabot tells her... My birthday. (laughs) Cabot tells her that it was the day after Chloe was killed. She asks Mrs. Wilkins why she told the detective she had seen Eric the day before when she actually hadn't. She says she lied because Eric told her to. She said Eric told her that some boys had found out about his past and that the other boys had done something bad and that they were going to make everyone believe that Eric had done it. Cabot asked her if she believed him and she starts crying and she says no. She's like, why didn't you believe him? And then she's like really crying more. And she's like, every mother knows her son. And she's such a good fucking actress. Mm. Oh my God. She says that Eric took the bracelet off of Chloe after he killed her and gave it to her. That's when Eric looks at her. Yeah. She tells everyone that she's sorry and that Eric shouldn't have ever been released from the detention center after he killed that boy. Eric's lawyer's like, I object. Even the judge is like, Mrs. Wilkins. Shh. <laughs> Yeah. And then she tells the judge, like, the judge from that court case had no choice because he was a kid. You fucking do. He's sick and he will kill again. She's, like, fucking crying so hard. And she's like, he was born bad and he will die bad. There's nothing anyone can do. Oh, that must have been so hard as a mom. I mean, I don't know anything, but you probably are like that. Yeah. The jury verdict comes back. Uh, Count of kidnapping guilty. Count of murder in the first degree guilty. Chloe's parents and that lady whose son died are like, oh. Mm -hmm. So Eric is being taken away. Benson and Stabler approach him and Benson's like looks like you're going away for a long time and he's like don't worry all right and he like smiles oh he's so fucking creepy mm-hmm. they tell him they know about the brownstone he was living in and they looked into it and he had no lease and never paid rent they, it actually belonged to an elderly woman who had no family and most of her friends were dead and they can't find her Stabler's like look nobody believes that you can do good not even your mother you know that this person deserves a proper burial just tell us where she is he says geez i don't know i'm going away for a long time so i should probably give notice do let me know if you find her and is taken away Uh, fucking toyota uh, god that was so good it was really good it was just good yeah good once they fucking got to max's house or whatever yeah you love a psycho i fucking love a psycho I, I have to tell you about this fucking kid. This episode is actually partially based on a true story about a kid named Jesse Pomeroy. Okay. Jesse Pomeroy was born on November 29th, 1859 to his parents, Thomas and Ruth Ann. He had one older brother. They were raised together in one of the Boston neighborhoods. Jesse was picked on because he was born with a hair lip and a white film over one eye, like when a dog gets a cataract or I guess when a person gets a cataract, but it was just like a Mm -hmm. white milky eye. I don't like saying that sentence, milky. I know, I don't like it. Yeah, white milky eye. He was also a bigger kid, so he stuck out. Also, his father was a violent 
violent alcoholic who regularly beat his wife and kids severely. Also, it's the late 1800s, so that spare the rod, spoil the child bullshit is being enacted. So his dad wasn't just hitting him to hit him. He thought he was disciplining him. So when Jesse would be punished, his dad would take him to the outhouse, have him strip naked and beat him with a belt until he bled. Uh, that seems a little excessive, but okay. Yeah. Also, Jesse had an odd little boy habit. He hurt and killed animals. Oh. I'm not going to tell you any details about it, but there was some specifics and it was like, whoop, we all know what that means. Mm -hmm. Harold Schechter, the author of Fiend, the shocking true story of America's youngest serial killer, a book all about Jesse Pomeroy, said in an interview that in his studies, he found that a huge standout of the upbringing of serial killers includes a theme of major humiliation. Okay severe physical abuse and you know the animal stuff and oh and head injuries okay oh that's right yeah. so his dad terribly physically abused him like i said he was terribly teased by other kids at school and the beating i mean it's almost impossible that he wouldn't have a head injury from that right before i started telling you about the things that began happening i'm gonna throw out a trigger warning this is little kid shit because it is a huge trigger for me i'm not going into major detail about the kinds of things that he did but there is a lot of fucked up shit that you can read about that he did and I did read about it it's just repeating it that's tough for me Right. on December 26th 1871 four year old William Payne was found tied to the ceiling by his wrist in a remote area outhouse he was nearly naked he was beaten terribly and had hypothermia but he lived soon after that more boys began to turn up with similar stories and escalated injuries boys would be found with stab wounds mutilation done to them just really really awful stuff they would tell their parents and police that an older boy told them he'd take them to a circus or he'd pay them to do an odd job then he would take them to this remote area and tie them up and do these things to them and every time it escalated the boys described this boy as having a marble eye he would dance around them as they were tied up and would perform sadistic acts and mutilations on them as he masturbated so joseph kennedy one of the survivors who had had his face slashed and head dunked in salt water was taken around by police to area schools to try and id his attacker how old was this kid the, the marble eye kid? He was 11 and 12 at this time. At one point, when the police were taking him around, he was in the same room as Pomeroy, but wasn't able to ID him. Not long after, for some reason, Jesse went into the police station, and it was that day because that young boy was there and he was leaving, saw him in that context and immediately ID'd him, and Pomeroy was arrested. He confessed right away after the police threatened him with a 100-year prison sentence and he had spent one night in jail. And he's like, fuck this, I'll tell you everything that I did. As a result, Pomeroy was sent to the Westboro Boys Reform School. He's like 13 at this time now. There are a lot of conflicting numbers, but this is a hundred. This case is 140 years old. So my math gets me to he was 13 at this time. Yeah. His mother refused to believe who and what he was. She swore he was framed and petitioned to have him removed from the reform school. While he was there, he was sentenced to 10 years. He was considered a model inmate. His mom won a release after he spent only 18 months inside. Wow. After he was released, he got a job at the newspaper stand that his family owned, which was in front of his mom's seamstress storefront. Okay. Six weeks after his release, on March 18th, 1874, he was working solo at his mom's shop. Ten-year-old Katie Curran came in to see if they sold notebooks. Pomeroy had her follow him into the shop basement so he could check. This is what he told her. Once mm -hmm. downstairs, Pomeroy slashed Katie's throat and repeatedly <gasps> stabbed her in the genitals. He later said he fuck? wanted to, quote, see how she she would react. After Katie was dead, Pomeroy hid her body under a pile of ash in the basement. He then cleaned himself up and went back upstairs to finish his shift at work. Jeez. As time went on, he was caught a few more times attempting to lure kids to go with him, but people that knew his history would intervene and just be like, no, 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 not don't go with him. Yeah. Just a few weeks later, after the disappearance of Katie Curran on April 22nd, 1874, four-year-old Horace Mullen was found brutally murdered and sexually mutilated in a marsh just outside the city. Cops Ugh. immediately were like, yeah, Jesse Pomeroy, the child fiend, the boy fiend. That's what they called him they arrested him immediately the details of horace's death lined up perfectly with jesse's previous crimes the difference is that he had escalated to murder Yuck. So after he was arrested, he eventually confessed to Horace. His mom was terribly shamed in the community and was driven out of business. 
So after selling her shop, workers were doing some renovations for the new owners and found Katie's body in the basement. He had not confessed to Katie's murder. So he's arrested, right? He's charged with first degree murder. There was a ton Mm -hmm. of back and forth arguing about where he existed on the sanity plane because the term psychopath hadn't been coined yet. He very much was one. They determined him to be morally insane, but that is different from legally insane and it doesn't keep you out of prison. Yeah. So he gets found guilty of first degree murder for four-year-old Horace Millen in February of 1875. He was sentenced to death by hanging. This is such a polarizing decision because on one hand, we're like, yeah, fucking kill this guy. He's a homicidal psychopath. But on the other hand, this is a 15-ish year old kid. Yeah, but at the same time, like back then, that was like 40. I was, I, yeah, like... <laughs> Why doesn't he have uh, four kids by now or whatever, you know? Massachusetts did not want to be the state to set the precedent of hanging a child. Mm -hmm. So his sentence ended up getting commuted to life in solitary confinement, which I would argue is fucking worse. Yeah, It's considered inhumane now for someone to spend more than a few days or max like a week in solitary confinement. Yeah. Jesse spent the next 41 years of his life there. His only contacts were the guards and his mother who visited him every month for the rest of her life. He became obsessed with escaping and had a dozen attempts over his term in prison, including one attempt that had a gas pipe explode in his face, causing him to lose an eye. He was trying to maneuver it to like blow out a window or blow out a wall or something, do something with the pressure and it ended up going off in his face. In 1917, Pomeroy's sentence was commuted again to move him to Gen Pop where he could be surrounded by the other inmates. Yeah. Jesse Pomeroy was moved to the Bridgewater Hospital for the Criminally Insane in 1929 in failing health where he spent the rest of his years until he died on September 29th, 1932 at 72 years old. Shit. I've never heard of that. That's crazy. I ne- How did I? Yeah. He Is this a well-known thing yes, or no? Yeah. He was the youngest in Boston's history of serial killers. Wow. I think in total, he had like 10 to 12 victims that they know about Mm -hmm. and two that they know about him killing. Mm. You know, I don't even I don't think he ever confessed to Katie Cullen. And that's it. That is the last episode of the season. Season four. Wrap it up. Okay. After our small break, we will be on season five, episode one, Tragedy. So there's this lady with a high-risk pregnancy. She's kidnapped, and she's getting closer to her due date. There's multiple suspects, and they've got to find her quick. Tragedy! Valerie! Huh? All right. Okay. In a couple days, on the 28th, we're having our first live show at Forward Craft and Coffee. If you have any ghost stories, please send them, like, quick. Send them quick. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll be able to pop them in. I got some some fun ones. Also, you guys, it's the end of the season, so we hate to do this, but it's important that we get ourselves a little break. We haven't taken a bigger break in a while, so we're going to be off until January 3rd. It seems like a long time, and I feel like we always over-explain ourselves, but we will be dropping a couple little treats over the break, and Mm -hmm. we also have Patreon. There's all kinds of benefits for each tier to get you through the break our friendship boats are monthly episodes of friendship where we tell our wild ass stories play games laugh about stupid shit that has nothing to do with this universe we also have our garbage cookie episodes from the beginning of patreon we started putting our unedited episodes up there so you get all of the rants all the extended jokes all the fuck ups and extra side conversations if you listen to the bloopers at the end of the regular episode and you laugh at them those are clips from the garbage cookies and there is so much more than that i always put those on there so people know like this is this is what you're going to find in the Patreon. Mm -hmm. Shit, last week's garbage cookie episode was an unhinged extra 40 minutes. 40 fucking extra minutes. (laughs) Oh my God. To our current patrons, don't you little peaches worry your sweet little juicy heads (laughs) because (laughs) (laughs) you're used to getting your extras and we're going to keep those coming. As usual, you'll be getting your November and December friendship boats along with a mini friendship boat in place of garbage cookies. So that's kind of what our garbage cookies are, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to do like mini friendship boats. Should we call them dinghies? Get it? (laughs) (laughs) Mini boat? Just the two of us in an inflatable raft at the high seas of friendship? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Tasha. Don't drink the water. Ahoy. Right? Ahoy. Ahoy. <laughs> Don't drink the water. Yeah, we're laying out. We're laying out our tarp. We wake up in the morning. We get a... 
a little bit of dew. We're going to keep ourselves alive. We're going to stay alive till January 3rd on these itty bitty dinghies. Call that one super wealthy friend and tell them that you want the captain's tier for your holiday gift that you know that they were going to get you. Join the Patreon. Get all this shit. Come on in. Check us out. I always feel guilty saying that we're going to take a break. Even if we just take a I week know. and now it's... But it's like every season is like 20 some episodes. It's a lot. Yeah. do need a break. Yeah. And this is just us doing this. Plus we have that new like Facebook messenger group where we all talk about stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. If you join the Facebook so join group, that. there's a chat in there. People took to it right away and it's super fun. Yeah. And there's we, like... A, we just, just like talk to everybody. Everybody talks to us and they talk to each other and we have fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love how like immediately everybody... Like I just love women, dude. I know. Everybody just like immediately was like supportive of each other. Somebody was like, I'm getting a new job. I was like, you got this. Yeah, I, love I know. Like, I love it. Or, Somebody's like, look at the new tattoo I got. People are like, oh my God, it's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a little fucking community. It's cute and wonderful and I love it and I love everybody and I love all of you guys and I never want to stop doing this. I love you. 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 Rate and review us. Email us at svpod at gmail.com. If you want to send us stuff, P.O. Box 176 to Forest, Wisconsin, 53532. Check out our Instagram at svupod. Join the Facebook group, SVU Pod Elite Squad. I love it. Hashtag little bit loud for all your indie pod needs. Join the Patreon. Also, we're doing a thing for every patron we have. We send a dollar every month to a different charity of the month. We try to keep it in this universe. Mm -hmm. If there's a charity that you like, send it to us and we'll look into yeah. it maybe it'll be a let us know on the first of every month whatever the fucking head count is for our patrons no matter what tier it's a dollar for each so that's the dollar amount we send yep all right well love you bye love you bye see you in 2023 i have no hopes Oops. of the future so it's probably gonna suck too ooh, ooh. Ooh, love you bye right. love you bye Say that again. Chemical you, in it. The water in the water in, the water in her lungs was tap water that had cleaning <laughs> chemical in it uh i saw my name is God, what was I, a sophomore in high school? A junior in high school? And I remember seeing it going, <laughs> okay, guy, mm -hmm. don't quit your day job. <laughs> you know who can fucking suss out a, a rap talent like a fucking truffle pig? <laughs> Me. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm blasting Loretta Lynn driving my kids to school. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. Oh, that was good. Kill Whitey. <laughs> 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 fucking, that's a good movie. Black sheep. Yes. <laughs> but you, you, you don't have to put that in. Or I'll just put, I'll put you saying it in somewhere. Benson and Stabler's stake out in front of Max's house. <laughs> like in house the trash. The fucking... <laughs> <laughs> uh, burn. Sorry. <laughs> I love the, uh, love the pause, the laugh, and then the burn. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> like in the trash. Benson and Stabler. You're such a bitch. <laughs> I love that you appreciate it. <laughs> I do. And to our elite squad patrons, Haley K, Sonia W, Sky K, Marissa M, Elky H, Annie G, Mary D, Andrew, Andrew Rebecca D, Miranda B, Shelby W, Lex. Lex, Emily T, Kayla W, Mallory G, Bonita R, Marin, Marin. Vanessa, Amy P, Jess M, Summer M, Melanie G, Courtney W, Ursula S, Emily A, Kate H, Uyana, Nicole R, Julia P, Sapphire, <laughs> <laughs> Kayla, Allison B, Catherine M, Kate P, Jessica S, Nicole M, Acacia V, Danielle W, Kelsey D, Jana M, Joshua H, Tammy J, Bear, Bear. Crystal, Lucy M, Trisha S, Sam D, Laura D, Laura I, Emily A, Angela D, Mac Attack, Mike, Casey W, Abby W, Alexis J, Lauren T, Cassandra S, Kaylin B, Camilla Z, Nisha G, Maggie D, and Kay Allen. We love you and appreciate you. You are all making it possible for us to continue doing this. We have so Thanks much so fun. Much. We like you guys a lot. We hope you like us. <laughs> We do. Yeah. Sally Field. <laughs> you like me. You really like. We gotta go. Let's yeah. let's be done. We're done. We're done for the year. This is the end of our year. On to season five. Ahoy hoy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bye. Oi, oi, oi. <laughs> oi! Season five. Shut up. I said ahoy get, hoy. Get 
Get in the boat. Chips ahoy. Get in the boat. Chips ahoy. The next two months is strictly friendship boats. Is this a pirate? Is he Australian? Is he faking an accent because he's on the run? Who knows? He's a British. He's a British <laughs> naval man. Oh my god, the dinghy's so small it fits in a belly button. Oh my god. Oh my god. Okay. We gotta go. All right, bye. I love, love you. I bye. love you, bye. I love you. I love you. I love you. A little more. Thank you.